I wish you all a good day. It is a very strange time. Today I'm going to talk about a feeding experiment with a sublethal neonicotinoid dosage. The effects observed with traditional assessment methods like used for regulatory e-testing and also the effects observed with a novel AI supported decounter. Four people prepared to talk. You can see the names on the slide. There will be two presenters. Katarina will present the part of the AI decounter and I will present the summary, the introduction and the results of the traditional assessment. So why do we do the studies? The reason why we try to work with sublethal effects is because it's very difficult to transfer effects which are observed in the laboratory to effects on the colonies or even on the field. Am I just, you can see some um, effects, sublethal effects, which has been observed in the meter corporal, but either they were done by a very limited number of bees or they were done in the lab. So what was the objective of our field study? We wanted to validate whether sublethal effects can be observed in a study design, which is based on the Omen study. We wanted to determine the influence of a 10-day feeding with 200 microgram in meter corporal per kilogram. The feeding rate was 500 gram sugar solution per day. So the actual rate the hives were getting was 100 microgram meter cuprate per day. And the concentration is known to show an effect. This is based on a paper from Galen, where they were feeding pollen patties and also sugar solution. Three pool cycles. So what we do, we used eight hives. We split them into control and treatment. Um, the hives were, had all larval stages, so eggs, larvae, and cells. There were no visible symptoms of bee diseases. The bees could fly freely. And in the area where they did it, there was reduced pesticide usage. Um, each hive had a digital hive scale and the APIC AI module. The assessments we, of the classical phase we did was we looked at forager mortality. Um, then we looked at the four days pre phase so the bees could use in the area, a 10 days feeding phase, and monthly colony assessment. The data you should see will be from the 10th of May to the 19th of July. We wanted to continue, but we lost um, first a queen on the 13th of June, and then further on we lost the hives because of the really, really high temperature. Here, a short view on the temperatures. The, the rain was about 160 millimeters. That's about 100 millimeters less than long-term average, and the temperature range was from minus one to 40 degrees Celsius. So now to the feeding. What happened? The bees in the neonicotinoid treatment consumed about an average 25% less sugar solution than in the control, so they, they noticed there was something, so there were some tea total bees to say. The rate consumed in the treatment over 10 days was half a milligram for the hive with the lowest consumption, about 0.9 milligram for the hive with the highest consumption, and the was hive differed significantly, but not the hives in between. So now to the mortality, our aim was to show there is no lethal effects. If you can have a look at the graph, you see an orange line, that's the treatment, the mean mortality of the treatment, blue line, mean mortality of the control. The shaded areas, orange and blue, show the minimum maximum amount. You can see there's a quite nice overlap until the end of the feeding where there is a higher mortality in the control and after the feeding is a higher mortality in the treatment, but none of the differences was significant. Now to the hive strength, the colony strength, you can see before the exposure started, the hives were more or less similar, very, very similar, with more than 20,000 bees, between 20,000 and 25,000 bees. And um, one month after the feeding or the first food cycle, there was significant reduction in the hive strength, but this reduction then was getting smaller and smaller because, because between treatment and control, there was no significant difference afterwards, but the variability in the treated hives was much, much higher than in the control hives. For the results of the brood, there was no difference between the eggs and the larvae. Actually, in the treatment, the number of eggs and larvae was slightly higher than in the control, but not for the pupae. In the pupae, after the feeding, there was a decline in number of pupae and then an increase in number of pupae. Further to the assessments for the food, um, there was less nectar in the treatment stores, but not significantly so. And Interestingly, one in the first after the first food cycle, there was an increase actually in the amount of pollen. So that's contrary to the expected effects. So we say there's a reduced activity. Then could we see these results in the hive weight? Yes, we could. You can see here during the exposure until 
the latent exposure hives were very similar, but um, after exposure or the, at the end of exposure, the hive weight of the treated um, hives declined quite dramatically and stayed lower than control hives. And you can see that at the end of June, the variability between the hives increased a lot. Again, the hive where the queen was lost was excluded after the 13th of June. So in result summary, there was no significant increase in the mortality during the feeding period. Um, the 200 microgram immunocorporate re clearly reduced the activity of the folger bees. There was definitely less nectar collected. You could see this in the change of the weight. And also there were less bees developing. The development from larva to pupa was less successful immediately after the feeding period. And the variation between the hives increased, but in both treatments, even though the same landscape was used. And now, Katharina. Each of the eight hives in the study was equipped with a digital monitoring device for the hives. It is a combination of hardware and software. Hardware, that is a camera which films all bees leaving and entering the hive and software which is later used to analyze the footage which is recorded. The devices themselves are solar powered, which means they are self-sufficient. When it comes to analyzing the footage we recorded, there is a three-step process. In the first step, we detect the bees on, on the images. In the second step, we look at how they are moving through various frames in order to detect their movement and say how many have gone out of the hive and how many have come back and how many maybe just have circled. In the last step, um, we detect pollen on the individual bees in order to be able to um, say how the foraging behavior has developed. We arrived the activity of the bees from the number of transits through the field of view of the camera. And what you can see in these three graphs is um, three different days of which on which we plotted uh, the number of bees entering and leaving per minute. And these three graphs are at different times, before treatment, during the treatment, and after the treatment. The blue and the green dots um, show the control group, and the red and the yellow show the leaving and um, returning behavior of the, control, uh, of the treated group. And what we can see here is that there is a de significant decrease in activity in the treated hive during the exposure period, which also corresponds with previous findings of other authors regarding the transitory effect. Because as you can see after the treatment, um, these effects were not significant anymore. If you're interested in how in looking at all the different days, we have um, included a link below. Taking a step back, we can look at how the level of activity develops over the course of three brood cycles. The colors are still the same as in the previous slide, but what you can see now also is that there's arrow bands which symbolize the respective um, minimums and maximums in the group of treated and control hives because there were four hives each. What you can see in the gray shaded area, which is the exposure period, is that there is a significant change in activity between the control group and the treated group. And um, this kind of goes on into the second brood cycle, but it is no longer significant. And this is something we've also seen in the, in the daily views before. We also looked at the pollen collection behavior of both the treated and the control hives. What we can see in the left graph is the, is the pollen carried into the hives per day by both groups. The gray shaded area is the exposure period and in this time you can see that there is a significant difference between the treated and the control hives. The treated hives are the yellow are the orange ones and the control hives are the blue ones. This is also emphasized in the box plot which you can see on the right. After the exposure period, however, it seems like some of the treated hives are trying to compensate for the loss um, of pollen, which you can see in the arrow band. However, others obviously seem not to do so. Now you may wonder, maybe the amount of pollen carried into the hive is only lower because there is a generally lower activity in the hives. Actually, it's not. We can see this if we look at the relative pollen collection. So the share of foragers which return with pollen as opposed to the foragers which just return without pollen. 
And what we can see here in the relative chart is that there's a significant decrease in the number of foragers which carry pollen on them as opposed to the control group. You can also again see this emphasized in the box plot. Because we have collected data continuously, we are now able to look at how the foraging behavior develops throughout the day. In this graph, you see the hourly collected pollen during the entire exposure period. And what you can see again is that the treated group has a lower overall pollen collection, but you can also see that it usually starts out quite normal in the morning, but then stops and um, decreases. So um, this may be because of the treatment application, which has been between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. each day. Thank you very much, Katharina, for your detailed um, results. So I want to sum up all the results we have seen so far. So what you can see that the bees actually did avoid the treated food. So there was a 25% less production. So there were some T total bees not feeding on the new EMIDA culprit. The concentration applied was clearly sublethal. There was no increase in mortality. Um, there was a reduction in the activity during the feeding period. You can see this. And there was a slight increase after the feeding period. And that was being confirmed with the hive monitor. We've seen it also on the increased amount of pollen. There were lower nectar and pollen resources also collected. That is confirmed with the hive monitor and also confirmed with the scales. There was no clear effect on the brood development but a reduction in the number of pupae, so which might be an indication that there are some fine tuning within the hive didn't work as well. There were transitory effects of the meter clobrid on the honeybee activity at colony level, and that was confirmed with the hive monitor as well. So you could see that the activity increased again. Why the activity decreased at the end is not quite clear. Um, we have now or APIC has now developed a new generation of the Hive Monitor, and this year there will be some more studies. I would like to draw your attention to the poster where there's the pollen recognition. And I would like to finish with the video and the references. Thank you very much. Finally, I'd like to invite you to check out our poster on pollen detection and quantification, which is 202P13. And I also want to tease that we're currently looking into the quantification of honeybee mortality, including the accuracy of our algorithm, and we're planning on publishing in the CTAC journal if we are allowed to. These are our references. In case you have any questions about our study design or our research methods, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. You can find both Silvio's and my email addresses in the very first slide. Thank you so much for your interest in our study.